The atmosphere is alive with anticipation as Nebula Aurora Borealis II awaits its mission, riding off the daring venture of Lucky Seven and the resounding success of NAB-1 planting a flag on the surface of the moon. The crew of NAB-2 aim to return to the surface somewhere new. The peaceful soundscape is overpowered by the sound of Nebula. Nebula, despite its size larger than any rockets before it, the primary appeal for this vehicle is its relatively cheap construction. Cluster tanks lower the cost of every launch, though as time goes on and funding becomes more readily available, the appeal of this begins to lose its color. Now, this version of Nebula was never truly designed to stay, even if it performed nominally, which truthfully, it hadn't. Even on the very successful Aurora Borealis 1 lunar landing, engine failures occurred. It just so happened they occurred at non-critical intervals. Aurora Borealis 2, however, is not as lucky as its predecessor. Six minutes into flight, stage 3 ignites its engines and separates nominally. Seven minutes into flight, and one of its four engines experiences an anomaly, performance loss. With one of four engines operating suboptimally, the efficiency of the entire stage is worsened, so the obvious choice would be to shut it down and burn the other three engines for longer. Well, the decision not to do this was made instead, simply for the sake of holding on to what little TWR the stage had to burn into orbit of the Earth. Eight and a half minutes into flight, it is determined the thrust loss is worth not losing efficiency any longer, and the faulty engine is shut down. The remaining three engines burn for 4 minutes and 20 seconds longer, after which it is blatantly evident the vehicle is far from orbit. An additional 700 meters per second must be burned from the lunar transfer stage of the vehicle, essentially meaning an abort to orbit. They have lost the moon. But for the sake of keeping things in a positive light, as the moon is no longer an option, the crew prepare for LEO operation instead, starting with whipping around to grab their lander, which will now simply be used as more internal space to move freely about. Something I have yet to mention, and it may not be readily obvious by the footage so far, is that this particular Borealis mission sports the rather fun addition of two single-seat foldable rovers meant to allow the crew to traverse great distances on the surface with ease, and also to deploy scientific equipment and biomes nearby their landing point. Though this operation is clearly not possible anymore, we still have some unconventional use for this hardware in orbit of the Earth. So, as soon as the crew is ready and safely away from the lunar transfer stage, we'll step outside. After flying the Borealis lander around, testing its systems and whatnot, it's time to do something about these rovers as mentioned. Well, since we brought up scientific equipment, a small RTG, antenna, and portable avionics, Chat decided we should try and make a satellite out of this hardware, simply because we could. So we grab all the supplies we need from our trusty cardboard box, slap them on the rover, and let it go. The artificial, artificial satellite will likely only keep its power for a few days. But now that all of their equipment is used up, the crew discovers something else in cargo, a basketball. 
so it's only natural to play catch around their spacecraft. And after getting their ball stuck, as the report would later read, the Aurora Borealis 2 mission comes to an end. Far from the moon, but still ending up with a little fun. A plane change and a re-entry burn is plotted, the crew re-enter Earth's atmosphere, deploy their parachutes, and are ready for the next flight. The same crew as before get to fly the Aurora Borealis 3 mission, making it all the way to lunar orbit, slightly inclined to offer a good shot at its intended landing zone. Not differing from the previous launch that was unable to get this far, the target for this landing is Kepler Crater, a relatively small crater not far from the lunar equator. It seems all is ready, however, it is here that we discover a pretty bad problem. The Aurora spacecraft no longer has enough fuel to get back home. Fret not, we haven't lost the crew, we've only lost the moon, again. But we're here in lunar orbit with a make your own satellite kit, and this time chat demands I make one out of the cardboard box. So, we do as chat commands. It was actually going rather swimmingly for a while too. Then, unfortunately, I made the grave mistake of touching a ladder during this process. Which, of course, sends our poor Kerbal hurling into the darkness with reckless abandon. Yep, a 100% certified, one-of-a-kind, should-have-seen-it-coming Kraken attack. Well, we've got the cheat menu to deal with that. Except, I rendezvoused with the wrong craft, and in Earth orbit. Whoops. Okay, no sweat. We'll find the right one and get back to making that cardboard box more than it ever dreamed it could be in no time. Yep, we're back. Wait, why is it night? Let's just get back inside before we do anything else. But of course the first thing we'll do is re-rendezvous with the cardboard box. I wasn't finished after all. I guess the force that sent our Kerbal flying away at that speed must have moved the spacecraft a bit in the opposite direction. Physics and all that. Regardless, back to work, I guess. We slap the remaining parts onto our masterpiece with a chef's kiss and call it complete. Only problem is we don't seem to have any connection whatsoever, quite literally making this the most expensive pile of junk we've ever assembled. So hideous, in fact, the entire atmosphere of the planet Earth has run away in fear. I can't say I blame it. And our orbital inclination has changed entirely. So at this point, I have a pretty conclusive bet that the game has entirely bugged out. So it's time to abandon all else and come home before things get any worse.
On stream, this was a very frustrating process, but our game was bugged to the point that saving and loading was impossible, the UI became unclickable, and error messages were abundant. And so in order to fix everything, I had to reload the game several times attempting various fixes. And what eventually worked was deleting the cardboard box satellite entirely. Turns out it was very, very potent Kraken bait. So unfortunately, we won't be doing anything like that with Kerbal Attachment System anytime soon. But back to the Lunar Abort on hand. Because of how little fuel Aurora had left, we had to use the Lunar Lander to perform a trans-Earth injection. And the reason we had no fuel is twofold, but both relate to the TLI burn earlier on in the mission. A small plane change maneuver on the way to the moon used a small amount of that precious fuel, but primarily a the fact that the lunar capture burn was over 1300 meters per second. Simply put, we arrive at the moon with too much velocity. The reason our TLI wasn't that great is probably slightly a result of my own poor planning. In 1969, the lowest possible relative inclination to the moon from Florida that we're able to get is practically zero. Uh, that we're able to launch to, that is. And zero is pretty much right on the lunar plane. Well, in the late 70s, that's no longer the case, it's been increasing, and the lowest relative inclination we were able to launch to at the time was 10 degrees. So, in order to not require a plane change burn on the way, we have to burn for the moon at the ascending or descending node, essentially the points at which our orbital plane intersect the moon's orbital plane. But the moon has to be in exactly the right place and at the right time for you to do this. We actually do this planning in the future from now on, but until this point it wasn't something I worried about all that much. Somewhere along maneuver plotting I ended up reaching the moon faster than I intended, using far too much fuel to capture. And speaking of poor planning, we almost run into a pretty bad problem during re-entry as well. I accidentally skipped off the atmosphere back into space. But luckily the capsule has enough life support to accommodate accidents like this, and we did slow down enough with the first pass that we were able to fall back down once more, safely to the Earth. But man, it was a roller coaster of a ride to save this mission and also my entire KSP save as well. But both are safe, and well, now that we understand what exactly went wrong this time around, we might as well try the flight again, but this time a brand new crew will give it a go. The same three Kerbals can't keep having all the fun after all. <laughs>